Good morning, everyone. My name is Gail Bollier, and I'm an Extension Master Gardener volunteer of Wake County. This morning, I'm going to talk about attracting wildlife and butterflies. According to the National Wildlife Federation, one million acres of wildlife habitat are lost to suburban development every year. We can help balance this loss by creating new habitats with native plants in landscapes, fields, and woodlands. Today, we'll focus on landscapes. My keyboard has decided not to respond, so I'm going to scroll, and I'm sorry if it's a little bit jumpy. Urban landscapes comprise an increasing percentage of potential wildlife habitat with proper management and some effort. These areas provide valuable space for many wildlife species, especially birds. When we plant for pollinators, we support a lot of other wildlife. Wildlife habitats typically, typically provide native trees and shrubs for cover, so they also make places feel more private and relaxing for humans, as well as animals, than areas with little vegetation. Wildlife habitats help promote biodiversity, protect our natural ecosystems, and provide beauty and enjoyment. Attracting birds, bees, butterflies, and other wildlife doesn't require a lot of space or resources. To welcome wildlife and to create a haven, your yard must provide three basic needs. Cover, water, and food. And in order to be successful, providing all of the elements in a suitable arrangement is the key. Your backyard can become a miniature wildlife refuge, attracting many different kinds of wild animals. Songbirds, rabbits, I know how some of us feel about rabbits, but I'm rather fond of them. Frogs or toads, bats, squirrels, and butterflies are the most common animals, but you may also find yourself watching raccoons, opossums, lizards, dragonflies, owls, and white-tailed deer. Cover provides more than just shelter. Wildlife need places to escape from predators and the elements. They need to feel secure while resting and safe while raising their young. Different types of animals need different types of cover. You'll attract more wildlife if you have a variety of cover types. A combination of trees, bushes, brush piles, and rock piles gives the best results. A mixture of trees of varying heights and species attracts a variety of birds. If you do not have mature trees, nest boxes will attract some birds. Rock piles are appealing to lizards, chipmunks, snakes, and cotton mice. Brush and rock piles are easy to build, but they must be built correctly. We can't just throw some rocks or branches in a pile and expect results. They should be constructed with large rocks or branches on the bottom and smaller materials on top. This allows animals fast access near the ground and good overhead cover once inside the brush or rock pile. The amount of cover we can provide will depend on the size of our yard. Even the smallest yard can hold a bird box and a few bushes that provide shelter for smaller species of wildlife. Water is critical for drinking, bathing, and breathing, and must be available year-round. A habitat may look to be appealing and good to attract wildlife, but it may be unused if there's no water nearby. In the summer, water must be replaced regularly to ensure that it is fresh. During the winter, water should be kept fresh and ice-free. The best way to ensure that you will meet a wide range of needs is to plant and encourage a wide variety of plant species so that nuts, seeds, fruits, berries, flower nectar, and mast are provided. If you want to attract and hold animals, animals year round, you need to provide the foods the animals need in each season. Birds that feed primarily on seeds may switch to insects while raising young in the spring. Chipmunks and bats have higher energy requirements in the spring when they wake from winter semi-hibernation than at other times of the year. A flower garden will provide food for butterflies, honeybees, and hummingbirds. Hummingbirds will also use special feeders filled with sugar water or commercial hummingbird nectar. 
Grasses that are not mowed will provide seeds for many species of small mammals and birds. For our, uh, in our yard, um, we keep our ornamental grasses up um, with the beautiful plumes and seed heads until late February. So that does provide some nice um, shelter and food for the critters. Planning your backyard wildlife refuge, a good place to start is figure out what do you want to attract. If you want to attract pollinators, plant a combination of native trees, shrubs, and flowers. Hang shelters for birds, bees, and bats. Leave dead trees if possible. Dead trees are also called snags. Leave stumps and rotting logs if you can. Hang hummingbird feeders. Ensure bird houses and feeders are maintained and well clean and kept clean and provide a clean source of water. Remove invasive species, minimize lawn area, and make wildlife friendly hardscape changes, such as if you have constant outdoor lighting, consider changing it to motion activated lighting and adding, consider adding a small water feature. Minimize or avoid use of herbicides and pesticides. Share what you've learned with neighbors and friends in hopes of encouraging others to create their own backyard wildlife refuge. Amphibians and reptiles are really important in our North Carolina ecosystem. Herpetofauna is defined as the reptiles and amphibians of a particular region, habitat, or geological period. The nickname is herps. And herpetology is the scientific study of reptiles and amphibians. They play a very important role and are an important role of our rich ecological heritage. Seeing them in and around your yard is a sign of a healthy environment. It's important that we recognize their value and learn how to conserve their habitats. I know there is a lot of um, fear of snakes and it just really makes me very sad when I hear the first inclination is to kill a snake. Um, so I do hope that we can help learn to value these wonderful creatures. All herps are ectotherms, meaning they're cold-blooded animals and rely on their behavior and the environment to regulate their body heat. Some hibernate during cold weather. This drastically slows down their body processes and they remain dormant and hidden until temperatures rise. Some herbs estivate, which is a behavior much like hibernation, only it's done during hot, dry times when moving about might cause them to overheat. And just a fun fact, frogs' long legs are for leaping and toads' short legs are for hopping. Excuse me, I'm trying to find my um, the slide that there it is, thank you for your patience. Amphibians, which is a Greek word meaning living a double life. In addition to salamanders, frogs, and toads, North Carolina hosts the most amphibians in the United States, over 90 species. Amphibian skin is permeable, meaning there is not a solid barrier between the environment and the insides of their bodies. Permeable skin allows amphibians to, one, absorb oxygen, and release carbon dioxide, in other words, to breathe or respire through their skin, and two, to provide protection for their bodies. The skin must remain moist for this process to work. Permeable skin is not the only way that amphibians breathe. Many amphibians use different methods of breathing throughout their lives, depending on their stage of the development. They also undergo metamorphosis, the process of transformation from an immature form to an adult form in two or more distinct stages. For example, frogs begin as eggs, go to tadpoles, well, change to tadpoles, and then change to young frogs, and then adult frogs. Amphibians might have lungs similar to those of mammals or birds, gills similar to those of fish, or a combination of permeable skin, lungs, or gills for breathing. Amphibians, most have claws, and amphibians have a larval stage. The drawback of having permeable skin is that toxins and pollutants from the environment 
can pass through the skin and into an animal's body. These toxins and pollutants might disrupt development or reproduction or even kill the animal. This is one reason the presence of amphibians is an important indicator of environmental health. Many species cannot survive and reproduce in polluted water. Snakes, and, uh, excuse me, reptiles, including snakes, lizards, turtles, and crocodilians. There are 22 species of reptiles in North Carolina. Reptiles have scaly skin and breathe with their lungs. Snakes are like lizards, but they don't have any legs or eyelids. Reptiles have claws, except leatherback sea turtles. And I don't know any snakes that have claws, so let's um, correct what I just said. Anyhow, reptiles and amphibians are vertebrates, meaning they have backbones. Many reptiles have claws. I should amend that too. Amphibians and reptiles require cover or shelter, just like other creatures. They live, hide, and seek safety from predators and the weather in wet and dry places where they can hibernate or estivate. Listed here on this table are several different things that can be considered cover or shelter. So if we can risk, if we can resist the temptation to tidy up um, and rake leaves and clean up damp and rotting logs, we will really help reptiles and amphibians and other creatures with their cover and shelter. During the cold weather, reptiles hibernate, usually to stay warm. And during the hot, dry, hot weather, they estivate, usually to stay cool. Amphibians' color and pattern help them hide, and they are some of the best camouflaged animals hiding in their surroundings. Water is critical to amphibians and reptiles. For amphibians, much of their life is spent in water and partly on land. They need access to breed and lay eggs. So they need access to wet sites such as pools, ponds, streams, or marshes to lay eggs, and in some cases to live as adults. All amphibians, regardless of whether they spend their adult lives in the water, require water for a reproductive stage of their life cycle. Salamanders, frogs, and toads all seek still water in which to lay their eggs. Amphibians' permeable skin must remain moist for the breathing process to occur. And I'll just repeat, that is one reason the presence of amphibians is an important indicator of environmental health. They cannot survive, and many species cannot survive, and reproduce in polluted water. Reptiles spend mostly, most of their time on dry land, but some spend a great deal of time in water. For example, we often might see a frog or turtle sunny on a log and then jump into the water to cool off. Most reptiles lay leather-shelled eggs on dry land. However, some aquatic turtles, alligators, and snakes need a safe dry land buffer along the water's edge in order to, in which to lay eggs. Keep in mind, if you are thinking of adding water to your yard, an elaborate water feature is not necessary. A large trash can filled with rainwater will attract tree frogs in the spring. If you're adding a pond, also keep in mind to include native plants such as pickerel weed, also known as Pontidaria codata. But do not add fish if you can help it because they will eat amphibian eggs and larvae. To prevent mosquitoes, you can use treatments which are available at gardening stores and online that contain a chemical named BT is relensis or BTI, and it marketed under the name mosquito dunks. These tablets are added to pools or other standing water and prevent mosquito larvae from surviving, but they do not harm other wildlife. Dragonflies are predators of mosquitoes, so planting underwater vegetation where dragonfly nymphs can hide and plants where adult dragonflies can perch and lay eggs will help attract dragonflies to your pool. Some salamander larvae prey upon mosquito larvae. Reptiles and amphibians are mostly carnivorous. Because they're ectothermic, they eat less often than endotherms, dependent on or cap 
uh, and are less likely to be seen foraging for food. In addition to plants, amphibians and reptiles eat small invertebrates, such as insects, worms, spiders, centipedes, tiny water creatures, or they scrape algae from rocks and or plants. Vertebrates are also um, a food supply, including fish, other amphibians, and reptiles, birds, and mice. Snakes eat mice and other rodents. Frogs are important prey for many species of fish, birds, mammals, and reptiles. Frogs will often make themselves look bigger to protect against snakes. They will puff themselves up to look bigger than they are since reptiles swallow their prey whole. Finding herps in your yard and surrounding area is a good indicator of the ability of your area to support the plants and insects needed for food and provide a variety of habitats available for shelter. Here's a listing of amphibians common to urban and suburban areas. And just glancing at those, um, I'm sure that many of you have seen at least one of those and probably several. I um, am always tripping over the anoles that love to spend time on our back stairs and also trying not to step on all the toads that are everywhere. So um, it gives me comfort knowing that it seems we may have a, a healthy environment here. If you have a water feature in your yard, consider excluding fish because they do eat amphibian legs, eggs, and larvae. As far as snakes go, North Carolina is home to six venomous snake species, including, or specifically, the copperhead, cottonmouth, timber rattlesnake, pygmy rattlesnake, eastern diamondback rattlesnake, and eastern coral snake. Copperheads are the most commonly found backyard venomous snake in North Carolina. They're secretive, typically not aggressive, and pose a threat only if provoked. If you find a venomous snake in your yard, keep pets and small children who might disturb the snake away from the area it was seen and leave it alone if you can. Hopefully, you've learned about the habitats of amphibians and reptiles so you can easily create a place for them in your yard. And on warm summer evenings, you'll be able to enjoy the beautiful symphony of frogs for many years to come. And hopefully we'll all have a better appreciation for the amazing lives of the diverse amphibians and reptiles that live in North Carolina. Even more importantly, we will know some simple, enjoyable and effective steps that we can all take to ensure that the symphony and beauty continues year after year. Here are some a listing of reptiles common to urban and suburban areas. So we'll see the copperhead is there and other harmless snakes. Um, I see quite a few of the black racer and I just find them absolutely fascinating. Watching them climb a tree is just incredible. I have to say I have yet to help one turtle cross the road this year and that simultaneously makes me happy, but also a bit concerned because uh, we're destroying so much of their habitat. I wonder where they all are. Creating an inviting butterfly garden. Who can think of a more serene place than looking at something like that picture? When we're thinking about habitat, it's important to provide for all life stages of the butterfly, the egg, the caterpillar, the chrysalis or pupa, and the adult butterfly. Providing a variety of native host plants encourages more diversity in the butterflies you can attract. Butterflies require very specific plants as host plants, and females will lay their eggs only on these plants. You can plant many beautiful flowers and you'll probably attract butterflies, but if you want them to stay and reproduce in your yard, you need to consider the needs. Along with the standard cover, water, food, keep in mind a few other things that will make your yard more attractive to butterflies and will entice them to stay. Butterflies are attracted to sunny areas. 
Improve shaded gardens, if you can, by opening the canopy. In temperatures over 100 degrees, butterflies can get overheated, uh, overheated, excuse me. So shady areas are important. Rocks help absorb heat. So they provide a place for butterflies to warm themselves in the morning before flight. Nectar plants or host plants should be the foundation for your garden if you're wanting to attract butterflies with a wide variety of color and type. Host plants for caterpillars provide an immediate source of food upon hatching and a safe place to form chrysalis or pupa. Host plants for butterflies provide nectar and also place to lay eggs. Any habitat is best if left a little bit messy or a lot of bit messy. Try to avoid deadheading and cleaning up. Try to mimic, mimic nature and understand your plants will get eaten by caterpillars and other critters, but the plant should be able to tolerate having been eaten. And avoid pesticides and herbicides, if at all possible. The butterflies that are on this page are from top to bottom, the common buckeye, red banded hair streak, and cloudless sulfur. Butterflies also require cover. They can find protection from wind, um, from trees, shrubs, fences, and buildings. Adult butterflies need areas to spend the winter. So leave snags, which are standing dead trees, or brush piles in your landscape. Morning cloak butterflies can hibernate in trees. What you might consider a weed is lunch or a nursery to a caterpillar. Butterflies cannot drink from open water. So providing moist sand or mud around your yard provides the best watering holes for them. If you notice where you often see them clustered, it's usually mud at pond edges or around puddles. You can create your own butterfly watering hole using moist sand or mud. And you can put some twigs across the dish or whatever um, shallow tool that you use um, and some rocks also. And they really do love that. Food for caterpillars. North Carolina is home to nearly 3,000 species of caterpillars. Before we grab the pitchforks and pesticides, we should consider that only about 3% of caterpillars are garden pests. Not to mention that caterpillars are baby butterflies and moths. And who doesn't want more beautiful butterflies and moths in their garden? The good news is their feeding typically doesn't harm plants in the long run though in large numbers, they can cause severe def defoliation. Adult butterflies mainly eat flower and nectar. They can also find sources of nectar from vegetables, herbs, and fruit blossoms. Butterflies may also get energy from eating fruit juice, sugar water, tree sap, fungi, and organic matter from animals. We should research what host plants are required for the butterflies we want to attract. When caterpillars hatch, they can't move far to feed. Don't forget the importance of trees and shrubs. Butterfly gardens are not limited to flowers. Many viburnums, hollies, sumacs, and dogwoods are important host plants for caterpillars. For example, the zebra swallowtail caterpillar only feeds on pawpaw foliage. The whole point is to provide food for caterpillars, so it is a good sign when leaves are being eaten. I have yet to have a parsley plant look, with the, appear whole. All of the leaves keep being eaten, but they're worth it. On this slide, the pictures from left to right are the Eastern Swallowtail Caterpillar. It lives and feeds on members of the parsley family, including carrots, dill, fennel, and parsnips. And on the right, the saddle, saddleback caterpillar moth uses sweet gum or hickory as host plants. Here's a listing of caterpillar host plants. If you don't have some of these, please consider planting some. And um, most are readily available at area nurseries or online. Butterflies prefer clusters of single flowers or tubular blooms, such as butterfly weed, 
butterfly bush, queen ants lace, gel pie weed, and milkweed. The more varieties one can plant, the greater our chances for attracting more butterflies. Remember also that planting in clumps, not rows, increases the likelihood of butterflies finding and choosing your garden. Plant early, mid, and late bloomers provide seasons long food. Ripe and rotting fruit in shady areas attract some butterflies. Example question marks, um, Eastern comma, and hackberry emperor. I will often throw some um, ripe or rotting fruit into the wood line, and I know it gets picked up readily. So hopefully the butterflies are also enjoying those. Here are some butterfly host plants um, that shrubs, flowers, and perennials. So also consider planting some of these. Right now, the Coreopsis and the Asters are in full bloom around here. Um, the butterflies were loving the snapdragons and the bee balm and um, the butterfly bushes and the verbena around here. So um, it really is beautiful watching them fly around to every plant they can get to. A bonus of butterfly gardening is you will probably attract other exciting and beautiful insects and pollinators. Bees of all sorts, beetles, moths, hummingbirds, praying mantis, etc., will be attracted to your garden. Beneficial insects, um, such as you can see the left upper slide, the predatory braconid wasp um, parasitizing the tobacco hornworm. So we should just leave that alone and let mother nature take its course. Wasps are very important pollinators. Attracting birds to your landscape. The sight and sound of birds brightens any day. Adding a bird feeder to the landscape is a good way to draw birds into your garden. But if you want to attract a wide range of birds, and have them call your backyard home, you need to create a suitable habitat. Modifying your landscape to make it welcoming for migrating and resident birds usually just involves adding a few more plants. From early April to mid-May, buntings, cuckoos, flycatchers, orioles, tanagers, thrushes, vireos, and warblers migrate from tropical countries in Central and South America and the Caribbean, north to their breeding grounds in the United States. Many of these migrant songbirds stay in North Carolina to build their nests and raise their young, while others continue farther north to other breeding areas. Our more familiar yard birds, such as bluebirds, cardinals, chickadees, robins, and woodpeckers, don't migrate to the tropics and are termed residents because they generally remain in North Carolina year round. It's important to plant in layers. Having a wide variety of plant species of different heights, flowering times, and growth forms will create the best habitat. Plant low-growing low growing perennials and shrubs under taller shrubs and trees. This helps to provide the vegetation layer that is important to birds. Different birds eat and nest on the ground or in the shrub, mid-story or canopy layers of your landscape. Individual nesting requirements are often unique to each species. The majority of songbirds nest in shrub type vegetation. About three fourths of all birds build nests less than 15 feet above the ground with an average height of eight feet. Some songbirds nest in tree cavities, in steep banks and cliffs, abandoned woodpecker holes, and on bare grounds. Most birds build their nests in the foliage of native plants, but snags or standing dead trees are important nesting sites for cavity nesting birds. Woodpeckers and bluebirds like to nest in cavities found in standing in snags. They should be protected when possible. Nest boxes provide nesting sites for a variety of bird species, including bluebirds, chickadees, great crested flycatchers, screech owls, titmice, and wrens. Nest boxes should be built following recommended dimensions for box height, width, 
entrance hole diameter, placement height, they should have baffles and allow for ventilation and drainage. To prevent easy access by snakes and other nest predators, place nest boxes on a wooden or metal post away from overhanging tree limbs. Predator guards or baffles protect nestlings from predators and should be placed below a nest box to further limit nest predation. Most birds are territorial during the breeding season, so place nest boxes and feeders at least 100 feet apart to prevent territory overlap. Nest boxes should be cleaned in February before the new nesting season begins. During the spring and summer, foliage is abundant and covers plentiful in the yard with a, with a combination of shrubs, vines, hedges, and trees. For winter, dense vegetation is important. So to protect from predators and harsh weather, evergreen trees and shrubs such as native pines, American holly, yaupon, wax myrtle, and eastern red cedar in your backyard habitat are especially important, especially adjacent to important feeding and watering spots. Cover can become scarce during the winter. Also, loosely stacked dead limbs, pruned limbs, and other debris that you've cleaned up around your yard, putting them to, a, to the side where it may be less unsightly, are really important to provide cover for birds year round. Water is not a limiting component of bird habitat in most of the Southeast, but it can be scarce in some areas during periods of drought. So a bird bath or water garden is very helpful and important. Birds normally obtain the water they need from their food, temporary ponds, temporary pools, dew on plants or the ground, or permanent water sources. Bird baths should be two to three inches deep, two to three feet in diameter, with a lip or edge for perching, and made of a rough surface to ensure good footing. Bird baths are best if positioned on or near the ground and about 15 feet from a perch or shrubby cover, but unused baths can be moved nearer to cover. Moving water is a real draw to, for birds and inexpensive pumps can be acquired and put into backyard ponds to provide the sound of running water that attracts birds and other wildlife. I have a little uh, terracotta fountain um, that I just replaced the pump and it was about $15 and it's, it's just pretty um, appealing to the birds and the toads. So the sound is also very appealing to me and very relaxing. Um, clean our bird baths weekly and we should keep them full of fresh, cool water. A bird bath can be cleaned with soap or chlorine bleach as long as it is rinsed thoroughly with water. In the spring, insects fill the bird's protein and calcium requirements for bone and tissue growth, and both migrant and resident birds feed on caterpillars and other insects present on new plant growth. During the late spring and summer, breeding birds continue to feed on insects, but also eat fruits as they become available. Insects and spiders are especially important to young songbirds born in the spring and summer. As migrant birds and their offspring fly south in the fall, they seek out fruits, which are high in energy and help offset the energy loss during migration. A fallow garden left to grow on its own will provide abundant and seed producing plants, but it should be motor tilled at least once every three years. Experiment, experiment with the frequency and season that you disturb the vegetation. Avoid mulling all vegetation in the fall because this removes winter cover. Instead, consider mowing only a half or third of the vegetation in any given year, or wait until March to mow or till. Some common foods for songbirds are the pine, oak, mulberry, dogwood, black gum, black gum, holly, and wild cherry trees. For shrubs and vines, they're blackberry, elderberry, blueberry, Virginia creeper, poison ivy, grape, and wax myrtle. Grasses and forbs are also common foods for songbirds, and they 
include bristlegrass, panic grass, crabgrass, pokeweed, ragweed, smartweed, and grain. Provide seed and berry producing plants, especially during fall migration. Native plants are particularly well suited to our climate and our native birds. Take note that the only female of some plant species, such as the American holly, wax myrtle, and eastern red cedar, produces fruit. In this case, make sure that male plants are present on your property or nearby for pollination. Leave dead seed heads at the end of the growing season to provide an additional source of winter food for birds. Winter seeds um, from native grasses and perennial wildflowers provide food for birds in the fall and winter. We can sometimes use a bird feeder to supplement natural foods. In winter is a good time to do that when their natural diet may be in short supply and to attract birds for our enjoyment and easy viewing. All feeders should be placed within 10 to 15 feet of shrubby vegetation, especially evergreen plants. Feeders should be cleaned every two to three weeks to prevent disease transmission. Homemade bird food may be used. Be aware that feeders placed within shrubbery are easily ac accessible to cats that may be stalking prey, and feeders placed under overhanging limbs are accessible to squirrels. Feeders should be placed either less than three feet or more than 30 feet from windows. Research has shown that feeders located between three and 30 feet from windows can cause excessive window strikes by birds. Cardinals, chickadees, grosbeaks, and buntings eat sunflower seeds. Thistle attracts American goldfinches, house finches, pine siskins, and purple finches. Juncos, morning doves, and sparrows eat white millet. White millet can be spread on the ground beneath shrubs, in piles of brush, or under above ground feeders. Bluebirds, catbirds, kinglets, nuthatches, pine warblers, woodpeckers, wrens, and yellow-rumped warblers enjoy suet. Orioles or tanagers like fruit slices. Place the fresh fruit side, flesh side up on tree limbs or wooden boards. Suet, whether store-bought or homemade, is enjoyed by an incredible variety of birds. Eleven hummingbird species have been spotted in North Carolina, though the ruby-throated is the one most of us see each spring and summer. They pollinate hummingbirds on a whole, pollinate more than 160 native North American plants and are easily attracted to a backyard. To attract hummingbirds, plant a variety of flowering plants that provide nectar throughout the warmer months. Hummingbird feeders are good artificial sources of nectar for these birds and should be filled with a boiled solution of four parts water to one part sugar, but do not add red dye. Ruby-throated hummingbirds will migrate even if feeders are left up. In some individual ruby throats or other unusual hummingbird species may visit a feeder during the winter, especially in the warmer parts of the state. Most individual hummingbirds leave North Carolina by mid-October and don't return until late March. Unfortunately, there are numerous threats to natural wildlife habitats from humans, from development. When natural lands are converted to housing and commercial developments and roads, etc., low-lying areas are filled in and leveled, so pools of water to breed, hide, or cool off are destroyed. Clearing forests remove sheltering trees, leaves, shrubs, and access to hibernaculum, which is protection of animals um, and provides safe nesting and hibernation sites. Traffic hazards um, are numerous. Uh, few wildlife can survive crossing a road. Uh, we see box turtles and other turtles, snapping turtles crossing roads and snakes basking on the roads and all sorts of other wildlife. Um, so whatever we can do to help 
improve our areas to provide natural habitats is something I really would love us all to do. Um, minimizing pesticides. Some pests do little damage. Some pesticides have unintended con consequences. We should use the minimum quantities and consider the weather, weather conditions and the seasonal requirements. And I'm sorry, I just realized I wanted to go on a little bit more um, on something and I apologize for this, but I think I, I missed something that I would love to say um, about sedimentation. Um, because when there is more runoff, there is more sedimentation. And it occurs when rain washes sediments such as dirt or silt into streams or other wetlands. It increases during construction because exposed dirt erodes easily during rainstorms. After construction is complete, rainwater runs quickly across impervious surfaces such as concrete, asphalt, or buildings carrying sediment and debris into nearby bodies of water. Sedimentation clouds the water and fills hiding places between rocks. Aquatic animals cannot get the oxygen and food they need from the muddy water and the plants they eat cannot survive. Also pollution, uh, rainwater washes toxins, including insecticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and petroleum products into waterways and low-lying wetlands. As far as minimizing pesticides, apply herbicides insecticides and fertilizers only in the smallest amounts necessary and only when absolutely needed. Always follow the instructions on the labels. Storm drains lead directly to streams, not to treatment plants. Avoid using any chemicals near water sources in storm drains unless labeled for such use. Rinse excess or spilled fertilizer off your driveway onto the lawn so it does not wash into storm drains when it rains. If your car is leaking oil, repair it and clean up the spill so that the oil does not wash into streams. To create one's own backyard habitat, we need to control our household pets that might harm wildlife or habitats. Outdoor cats and dogs prey on lizards and a variety of other wildlife. Studies have shown that up to 90% of outdoor domestic cats diet can be wild animals. Keep your cat indoors and restrict your dog from wildlife habitats. According to the American Bird Conservancy, outdoors, cats are a non-native and invasive species that threaten birds and other wildlife, disrupt ecosystems, spread diseases, and kill approximately 2.4 billion birds every year in the U.S. alone, making cat predation by far the largest source of direct human-caused mortality to birds. As predators, dog populations have significant impacts on native species and as a consequence, have the potential to alter ecosystem structure and function in priority conservation areas. They also trample leaves, disturb garden pools, can compete with native predators for prey, cause losses to livestock and transmit disease. So let's plan for wildlife and ourselves and consider how best to improve our little corners of the world Provide, by providing food, water, cover, and places for wildlife to raise their young, our communities can improve and our garden may be able to join the more than 150,000 certified wildlife habitat sets, sites across the country. Here is a listing of resources that have been very um, helpful in this presentation. And I thank you very much for your time. And if there are any questions, I'll do my best to answer. Thank you very much. All righty. Thank you, Gail. There were a couple of questions that came in. Um, sure. Jessica, okay. first off, okay. First off, Jessica's asking, can you tell us the difference between a skink and an anole? Oh, okay. Well, this is a non-scientific um, definition. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go to my best friend um, <laughs> on the internet. But anyhow, 
the anoles are the little brown critters that look pretty smooth. And let's go back to this. Um, forgive me, I'm going to go find this slide here. Um, let's see. And this, did you say skink was the other yep. one, Blake? Yep. Um, the skinks have the gorgeous little neon blue stripes. And that's the ones I see in our um, in our backyard. Um, I have I've started seeing skinks again. They're black with the pretty blue line. This pack, this picture right here is what I um, look similar to an anole that is in my backyard. And one of my good friends, who is very knowledgeable, identified it as an anole to me. So does that help? <laughs> I hope so. Okay, <laughs> uh, Marilyn's asking, can you please tell us the best locations for nest boxes for bluebirds and bats? Specifically, hide off the ground, sunshade, um, directional exposure, morning, afternoon, or all day sun. Um, for bat houses, I would have to look that up to be sure because we hung up, we hung um, ours quite a while ago at the wood line, and I do know that they want it warm. But I would have to look that up and I'd be happy to if you give me a few minutes because I don't want to give you any incorrect information. Um, as far as bluebirds, I, I also would look it up because I don't typically commit those to memory and I don't want to give you anything in, inaccurate. Our bluebird house has been um, hosting two different um, breeding cycles the past few years. And we have it facing the um, west and on a pole about 30 feet from our house. So again, I'd be happy to take your um, contact information offline and look that up for you. I'm sorry, I don't want to give you anything accurate. No worries. Yeah, it's better better just to be safe and, and not disseminate inaccurate information. <laughs> um, there aren't really any more questions coming in, but I did have one question. So I noticed with, um, <clears throat> so like with your, your talk about uh, attracting butterflies and caterpillars, you had like a list of plants that are like host plants for butterflies and caterpillars. But like your discussion of attracting lizards and amphibians, there wasn't really... There aren't like host plants to like attract because I guess, well, they're not they're not herbivores. So they're not attracted to plants for like food purposes. Are there plants that you can plant to attract lizards and other reptiles? And 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 how do they attract them? I guess. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, I I know that, let's go back to this slide. Sorry, I hope no one's getting dizzy. <laughs> um, so yes, this is the slide for food for reptiles and amphibians. So they do eat some plants. Mm. As far as the specific plants, I am not sure, but I know we have about a trillion toads here and they love to be, um, one part of our yard is pretty wild. It's got a lot of, at this point right now, blooming Baptisia. Mm. The toads love that. And um, they love being in. Oh, I, I see someone just wrote a comment, I think Marilyn, about the turtles eating Mayapple. It, it fleetingly showed on the screen. So mm. I'm sorry, Blake, I would have to look that up to be sure what scientifically is proven okay. to attract reptiles. Sure. And amphibians, but um, yeah, I'm sorry. It seems to be no my um, my preferred response right now, huh? <laughs> or at least not preferred, but <laughs> yeah, it's consistent. Sure, so. that's okay. It's a fair response for sure. 
Okie dokie. Well, that looks like that's all the questions that we have in the chat for today. So thank you very okay. much, Gail, for pulling this presentation together for us and delivering. It was it was wonderful to be sure. And well, thank, thank you very much. You're kind. So um, sure. And okay. I think someone put their email up to me so I they could sure give did. them the information. Um, yes. So offline, could you give that to me, please? Yeah, I can do um, that for sure. Okay. Wonderful. Right. And, and um, I think that might have been um, for the bat and bluebird house. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yes. All okay, right. That would be great. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. You have a terrific yeah. day and um, happy fall. So thank you. <laughs> for sure. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for this Master Gardener presentation. We do have another one on the schedule for October, but we have been trying and struggling for half a year now to get somebody to commit to deliver that talk on that day. So uh, put it on your calendar, but don't be surprised if that one gets canceled. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for being with us here today. Uh, we hope we'll see you around. Y'all take care.